Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the Advancing Science Capabilities with Data Harmonization, NASA's Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2, or HLS Products, Earth Data Webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It is 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. What I'd like to do first is just begin with a few logistics. To ensure the best audio experience, all participants have been placed in silent mode. But if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A panel rather than the chat located on the right side of your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted to the NASA Earth Data website as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a week of completion. And once completed, what I will do is I will send an email to all registrants with the recording links and also a link to the presentation slide deck used in today's webinar. As far as timing is concerned, this webinar will be a bit longer than our webinars normally are, so we've added uh, 15 minutes uh, to the webinar. So it'll be an hour and 15 minutes long with one hour allocated to the presentation and demonstrations and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. Depending upon the volume of questions that we receive, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. During today's webinar, we will have two speakers. Our first speaker is Danielle Golan. She is the Science Communications Lead at the NASA Lands Pro excuse me, NASA Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC. Our second speaker is Brian Freitag. He is the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 or production team lead and a research physical scientist at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. What I'd like to do now is I'm going to pull up this afternoon's agenda. Okay. Danielle will kick off this afternoon's webinar with an introduction to the HLS project, and then from there, we will transition over to Brian for a more in-depth description and discussion of HLS products. After this, Danielle will pick back up with a tour of the LPDAC website, and she will show you how to find data learning resources to work with HLS data, visualize HLS data imagery layers using NASA Worldview, and also search and order data using Earth Data Search. Afterward, Brian will provide several U HLS use case examples, and he will conduct a live demo to show you how to visualize the HLS burned area imagery layer using the Fire Information for Resource Management, or FIRMS, tool. Danielle is going to wrap up this afternoon's talk with some important contact information, and then once she has finished uh, with her presentation. We'll transition to an optional final set of polling questions, and I will give these, uh, you know, about five minutes or so within the webinar itself before transitioning to the Q&A session, but I will leave the questions open much longer for those of you who would like to provide feedback. From there, we will move to the Q&A period. Depending upon the volume of questions that are received, again, we'll extend the Q&A period 15 minutes. Just a quick note about the Q&A period. We will try to answer all of the questions within the time allotted, but if we're not able to get to your question, our speakers will be able to follow up with you offline. With that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and toss the presenter role over to Danielle. And give me just one second here, who will kick off this afternoon's webinar. All right, so Danielle, you should have, give me just one moment, you should have presenter role in just a moment here. The next, there we go. All right, perfect. Perfect, thanks Jennifer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, my name is Danielle Golan, and I am the Science Communications Lead for NASA's Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or the LPDAC. I just want to thank you all for taking time to listen to our talk today. And so with that, let's go ahead and get started. So before we dive too deep into HLS, I did want to provide a quick bit of background about the LPDAC. At the LPDAC, we process, archive, and distribute land remote sensing data, including Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2, or HLS data, to the Earth science community at large. We also provide resources to teach users how to apply the data. The LPDAC is a joint partnership between NASA and the USGS. 
And while we are a NASA DAC, we are, our DAC is located at the USGS Earth Resources Observation and Science, or Aero Center, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. While HLS is just one of the data set options from the LPDAC, our archive provides access to over 7.8 petabytes of data and extends from 1981 to present, with many temporal ranges in between, including daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, and more. And the data ranges from one millimeter all the way up to 5,600 meters in spatial resolution. Now, full disclosure, it's a little unfair to say one millimeter, as our millimeter level data is over specific science reserves in Minnesota, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. So if your research happens to be over those specific science reserves, then I have some really great data for you. But if not, then you might be interested in a larger portion of our archive, which starts at a 15 meter resolution. This image on the left shows one of the world's largest solar energy parks in India at that 15 meter resolution from the Terra Aster sensor. And on the right, we can see a view of the Earth from the Suomi NPP satellite sensor at that 5,600 meter resolution. So using data distributed by the LPDAC, we can see down to solar panels and as large as the entire Earth all in one day. And most importantly, everything we're going to be talking about today is available to you at no cost. But today we are here to talk about HLS, so let's dive into it. Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2, or HLS, is the first data set from the LPDAC to be cloud native, meaning it's produced in the cloud, it lives in the cloud, and it can be accessed from the cloud. HLS produces a consistent harmonized surface reflectance product from Landsat 8 Operational Land Imager, or OLI, and Sentinel-2 Multispectral Instrument, MSI data. These combined measurements provide global observations of the land every two to three days at a 30 meter spatial resolution. And HLS is our first data set that's fully available in the cloud, as I mentioned, as the LPDAC works towards moving our entire archive to the cloud. Now there are two version two data sets currently available from the LPDAC. The first is the HLS L30 data set, which is derived from Landsat AOLI data. And the HLS science team is currently working on incorporating Landsat 9, so that data should be available soon. The second data set is the HLS S30, which is derived from that Sentinel data. These data are available across the globe, as I mentioned, at a 30 meter spatial resolution, and they will be available from April of 2013 to present for the HLS L30 or Landsat product, and November of 2015 for the HLS S30 or Sentinel product once historical processing has been finalized. Now, this is a relatively new data set, so we are still historically processing the data. Currently, the L30 data are available from April of 2013 to present, as we just completed historical processing recently. But the HLS S30 product is currently available from mid-2020 to present. And as these are cloud-native data, they are available as a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF or COG file format. So that kind of covers the introduction to HLS. Now, Brian Freitag, a member of the HLS science team, will go a little more into the details of the data. Yeah, great, thanks, Danielle. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody for attending. I know we, it looks like we've got a pretty good audience, so I appreciate your guys' time today. To start off, I think I just want to start, up, start with a definition. So I think there's a lot of things going on with data harmonization and merging of data products. I think I want to make sure that we're clear here in terms of what we're doing with harmonization. So when we say harmonization for harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2, essentially what we're doing here is we're taking the data from the Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 uh, instruments uh, from USGS. We're taking the data from the Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B mission uh, or instruments from ESA. And then we process those independently and generate two independent data products. But in that processing chain, we essentially modify or at least adjust the Sentinel-2 uh, input data to match the Landsat input data, so the Landsat 8, Landsat 9 data, so that the two independent products can be put together and used interchangeably. So essentially, we have two uh, independent product streams, but essentially, when it finishes, you can use those two uh, to create a denser time series than you would originally be able to adjust Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B, or Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. And so the reason that we're able to do this is because of spectral similarities between the two instruments. So for Landsat, they've got the optical land imager. Uh, for Sentinel-2, it's the multispectral imager. 
and we'll go, we'll go through those uh, instrument characteristics here on the next slide, but that allows us to have a virtual constellation um, where we can get two to four day coverage of the entire globe at about a 30 meter resolution. So if you go to the next slide, please. So looking at the two instruments, you can see obviously there's a fairly decent amount of information here on this table. What I really kind of want to focus on is, is kind of toward the middle where you see the repeat cycle. So the repeat cycle um, outside of the parentheses is essentially a single instrument. So if you just had Sentinel-2A in orbit, you would have a 10 day revisit period for the same location on the globe. So that basically means if you live, um, well, I'll say Huntsville, Alabama, where I am right now, if a picture was taken of Huntsville, Alabama, um, today, then the next one would come around 10 days uh, from now. You add Sentinel-2B to that constellation, now it's a five-day revisit period. Similarly, for the Landsat 8 uh, and Landsat 9 imagery, if you just have Landsat 8, you would have a 16-day revisit period. Um, and then for the addition of Landsat 9, when you have Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 in orbit, then you have um, an eight-day revisit period. If you take those two together, like we're doing here with the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel product, that's where we get down to the two to four day revisit uh, period for anywhere on the globe. Um, <clears throat> equatorial crossing time here is gonna be in the morning. So we align all of our uh, stuff with using uh, modus aqua terra, or sorry, modus terra. Um, and then you can see that the spectral coverage between the two instruments is essentially the same. Uh, we do carry the two thermal bands from Landsat, but for the optical imagery, you can see that we cover the same spectral range. And uh, we have specific information about the, the band um, ranges here coming up a little bit later. Um, and I think that's pretty much all that we'll go through for this particular table. We'll get a little bit more detailed, I think, on the next couple of slides. So next slide, please. Great. So one thing that I want to also make clear is we talked a little bit about, you know, the definition of what we mean by harmonized. I also want to make sure we have a clear definition of what we mean by global coverage. Okay. So global coverage uh, for HLS processing essentially means all global land outside of Antarctica. So we're not doing any kind of Antarctica or ice studies down in Antarctica. Basically what we're doing here is just taking the land surface uh, anywhere here that's shaded in green is an HLS tile. Uh, so you should see imagery for that specific location. And Danielle's gonna go through a little bit of a, a walkthrough of uh, NASA Worldview. We do have this grid in NASA Worldview. So if you are interested in looking at a specific location, you can zoom in on that specific location and get the specific tile ID for that location uh, to ensure that you know, we have your area of interest covered with the HLS products. Next slide, please. So just a few data set uh, statistics. As Daniel mentioned for HLS L30, we've gone back to April 13, or sorry, April 11th of 2013. That is the entire record. So HLS L30 now is just in what we call a forward processing mode, where as new data comes in from Landsat 8 and Landsat 9, we do process that into the HLS L30 product. Um, that corresponds to roughly uh, about 8 million granules that we have available for you to look at. Uh, for just Landsat 8, we have an average uh, number of files on the order of about 23 to 2400 files per day. That is cyclical with seasons. So as you get to Northern Hemisphere summer, we do see an uptick, uh, obviously, because there's more land in the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and then when we add, or when Landsat 9 data comes online, which actually should happen today, um, you'll see that number double. And so then the average daily volume for everything back, you know, from uh, the Landsat 8 data only is about three quarters of a terabyte. With the addition of Landsat 9, we expect that to be somewhere closer to a terabyte and a half per day. For HLS S30, as Danielle mentioned, we go back to September 29th of 2020. Uh, historical processing, I saw a question pop up in the, in the chat about when that will finish. We hope to have that finished by the end of this year for uh, HLS S30. It is a larger number of, or a larger volume of data that we actually have to process. Um, with the two instruments uh, providing uh, measurements or observations uh, of the globe, you know, we have more data that we have to actually get processed through uh, the system, so it takes a little bit longer. And so the average number of files we have uh, for HLS S30 is on the order of about 6,000 files per day. That does change again uh, with the season, but that corresponds to roughly about two terabytes of data per day. Next slide, please. So some general data set statistics. So 
as you may guess from the, the name, it's a 30 meter resolution. Uh, our latency here is about a two to four day revisit, or sorry, a two to four day latency. Um, that is typically tied to our, um, the data that we use for MODIS for atmospheric correction. Uh, we get that data from LADSTAC and we wait for the scientifically validated uh, products to come in rather than the near real time products. And so that's typically a two to four day latency before we get uh, that processed. So we actually turned on the Landsat 9 uh, processing on Tuesday. Uh, we expect those first scenes to kind of start populating today, essentially is what that means. The data format is cloud optimized geotiff as uh, Danielle mentioned. What we hope to do and what we'll show a little bit later is some of the things that you can uh, use building upon that cloud native uh, data format and how you can access that data natively in the cloud and then build pipelines around that. Our granular structure is gonna be 13 single band data files for the HLS S30 product and 10 for the HLS L30 product. We'll show a little bit more about that a little bit later. We do carry uh, four uh, angle bands. That's essentially your solar zenith angle and solar azimuth angle, and then your viewing zenith angle and viewing azimuth angle. We carry a QA band that we named the F mask layer, which essentially is just a cloud masking and uh, water masking algorithm. And then we have a browse image that we uh, provide. So Danielle will show you a nice example of Earth data search a little bit later. There's browse images for each of the tiles that we generate that you can look at to quickly see if that's a scene that you may be interested in downloading and looking at a little bit more uh, closely. And then we also provide a stack of metadata record, which essentially enables you know, some of these cloud native uh, services to be uh, built and more useful for the community. Next slide, please. So this is something I think that I just wanted to kind of show and go through really quickly. Obviously you can see that for HLS S30, all of our data is being sensed uh, and visible to shortwave IR uh, component of the electromagnetic spectrum. The one thing that I'll note is that in the file naming convention, which Danielle will go through a little bit later, you'll see this B0102030304 that corresponds to the band name as specified here. Um, for true color imagery, they are the same between HLS S30 uh, and HLS L30. They do start to deviate from that point forward. So if you start doing composite layers, uh, we'll show you a little bit later with this Swear false color composite that we use for fire monitoring. Uh, do be aware that the band names are not consistent between HLS L30 and HLS S30. That's because we basically take the band names from uh, the native products and then we generate them uh, or retain that name within the HLS uh, geotiffs. Next slide, please. So these are the bands that we uh, retain for HLS L30. You'll note that band eight is missing. That is the, um, that is the PAN band for Landsat 8. We do not carry the PAN band within the HLS processing system, um, but we carry all the other bands. So we also carry the two thermal bands. We do reprocess those to be a 30 meter resolution product, um, but obviously that's not something that is really a part of the harmonized product in the sense that Sentinel doesn't have a comparable thermal IR uh, band that it can use in conjunction with uh, the, the Landsat products. So the bulk of the, the the bulk of the application for HLS in terms of building a, dense, a more dense time series will fall within that um, visible to SWEAR or shortwave IR uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, and I think that that is my overview. I think, Danielle, I'll turn it back over to you uh, to go back through some of your use cases and examples. All right, thanks, Brian. So now that we've provided background on the data as well as details of the, about the data, how can you actually work with the data? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the goals of the LPDAC is to help users learn how to apply the data. The LPDAC website offers a wide variety of resources related to the data. And in a few minutes, I'll be providing a walkthrough on where to find those resources on the website. <clears throat> Most importantly, we do have the DOI landing pages. We have DOI landing pages for all data products that are distributed by the LPDAC. These pages provide key information about the data, including a description of the data and the data layers within the data, as well as any documentation that relates to the data. We also have several great tutorials and other resources that provide imagery and data examples that I'll kind of cover a little more in our website demonstration. Okay, so now that we've talked about the data and the resources, well, how can you actually access this data? As I mentioned, HLS has a cloud native data set so these data are available from the cloud. There are two tools you can use to visualize 
search and download HLS data, and I'll be providing a demonstration of both of these tools. Now, if you really just want to see HLS data, then I recommend using the visualization application NASA EOS DIS Worldview. With Worldview, you can visually explore the past and present of our dynamic planet from a satellite's perspective. This is great for looking for new scenes or examining changes on the planet through different types of data. For example, we can observe impacts from natural disasters with HLS data or even seasonal changes in agriculture. And if you want to search and you can use NASA Earth Data Search, which provides the only means for data discovery, filtering visualization, and access across all of NASA Earth Science data, including HLS. So now with that, let's dive into the demo portion of my talk. First, we'll be looking at the LPAC website, and then we'll walk through how to use NASA's Worldview and Earth Data Search. All right, so on screen, we have the LPDAC website. Uh, you'll go to lpdac.usgs.gov to get to our website. Our website offers a wide variety of information on sensor details, information on all of the 580 data products we distribute, as well as tools and resources you can use to access and work with the data and see how it's being used in the science world. Now, from the homepage, we do have a banner that shows some of our most recent data and action stories. These are stories written in-house by the LPDAC staff about how the data are or could be used. Below that, we have recent news and events. And below that, we have a collaborate section with us. So you can follow NASA Earth Data on Twitter and Facebook. You can join the Earth Data Forum to have a data chat with different types of data users. You can sign up for our LPDAC listserv. Um, we have several different ways to kind of interact and communicate with the LPDAC. But from this blue bar at the top, we do have a about section, data, tools, resources, content, and then a general search for the website. So under about, we have our news archive. I do strongly recommend if you're working with data to just frequently check the news archive in case there's any new information coming out about the data set you've been working with. Here, if I type in HLS data, it'll pull all of the news announcements that relate to HLS data. And our news archive does go back to the year 2000. So we really do have quite a few bits of news pieces about the data. Now, speaking of data, under the data tab, we have our get started with data. We have our search data catalog, and we also have our data citation and policies. So all LPDAC current data and products that are acquired through the LPDAC have no restrictions on reuse, sale, or redistribution. Um, so don't worry about data policies. You are good to go. Um, we do request that if you are using data distributed by the LPDAC or any of our tools that you cite them, and I'll kind of show you how to do that later on. But for now, let's start with this Get Started with Data. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Get Started with Data, and then I'm going to click on this Collection Overview section. So this kind of tells us about all the different information about data from distributed by the LPDAC. So here I'm going to go ahead and click on HLS. And this will provide us a brief background about HLS that Brian and I have kind of covered today. And then we have two green buttons that we can click on, the HLS products table or the HLS overview. I'm going to start with the HLS overview. We have an overview for all of our main sensors. And the overview provides you a lot of key information. So it has an introduction to that sensor. The naming conventions that Brian mentioned earlier. So when you actually download a piece of HLS data, the file name provides a lot of key information you might not realize. Uh, for example, it provides the short name, so I know that this is an HLS S30 or Sentinel product. It has the military grid system, so the tile of where this tile is located on the Earth. So we have the T60HTE. It has the Julian date of acquisition, as well as the time of acquisition, the granule collection, the spectral band that you're looking at, and then also the data format. So in this case, that cloud optimized GeoTIFF. We also have the long name for the data set. So HLS Sentinel-2 Multispectral Instrument Surface Reflectance Daily Global 30 Meter Version 2. So that's providing information about the instrument, the sensor, uh, the science keyword or geophysical parameter, the temporal resolution, that it's a global product, and the spatial resolution and the collection version. Below that, the Overview page provides information on the temporal and spatial resolutions, as well as the tiling system, so that military grid reference system. 
the HLS data processing. And then it also has those spectral bands that Brian spelled out earlier today, as well as information on metadata and tools and services. So quite a bit of information is available from the HLS overview page. Next, we have this green button for the HLS products table. This is going to take us to the search data catalog, but pre-filtered down to just show you HLS data. Now, if you wanted to get to this page just to look for data in general, you would just go back up to data and click on search data catalog, and then you can filter down based on temporal range of your data, what collections you're interested in, what versions, what keywords, spatial resolution, and more. So you can click on this and just select the different options that you're interested in. But here we have this filtered down just to HLS data for us. And we can see this either the data products in a list mode. So that provides me the short name, the collection, the science keyword, the spatial resolution, as well as the temporal resolution. Or we have a card mode that provides you kind of a preview of what your data might look like. That short name we talked about earlier, version two, the long name I just mentioned, the collection, the science keyword, and then any tools that are associated with that data. So in this case, NASA Earth Data Search, as well as our data prep scripts. And when I click on this image, this is going to bring up the DOI landing page that I mentioned earlier for the HLS L30 data set. So in the background, we have kind of that um, image of what this data just kind of looks like in general. We have the short name of the data set, the version, that long name I mentioned, the science PIs for the data set. And then we have a nice row of buttons here that you can click on to learn more about this data product. So our documentation button provides information on the user guide, the ATBD, and in this case, also an Earth Data Search Quick Guide. So if you're really looking into foundational information about this data product, you'll wanna investigate and read up on the ATBD. Uh, and the user guide also has a lot of really helpful information. Next, we have our Using the Data button. This provides resources on the website where we mentioned this data set. So in e-learning, we have um, a couple of videos and some tutorials to work with HLS data. We have a data and action story that relates to HLS data. And then we also have a publications table on our website. And when I click on this link, it'll filter the publications table down to just science articles that cited or mentioned this data set. And I'll show you that publications table in a few minutes. Next, we also have access data. So this provides the tools that you can use to access and work with this data. So I have the name of the tool, the functionality of the tool, a brief description of the tool. And for HLS data, we have a button to the right that will take you to NASA Earth Data Search with the HLS L30 product already selected. So you can just go ahead and get started looking for data within your study area. Now I mentioned citation earlier. If you are using data that's distributed by the LPDAC, we would love for you to cite it. So we did create a citation generator to help with that. So we have two popular citation styles, APA or Chicago. You pick the style that you prefer, you copy the citation, and then you can paste it right into your research paper, and there you've properly cited the table or the data set. Now, citing the data has two benefits. One, it helps other people find your paper, and two, it helps other people looking for data examples um, to be able to find more examples. And this is a great way for us to populate our publications table so other researchers and scientists can have um, more access to being able to find your paper a little easier. We also have a related products button. This button is a, a button that allows users to see other data products distributed by the LPDAC that relate to this product. So frequently we hear from users that they don't really have time to investigate what other data might be right for their study. Um, so this was a way that we had to just kind of help that out a little bit more. So this will take you to that search data catalog pre-filtered with some data that might relate close to the HLS L30 product. All right, below that we have a description of the data. We have a characteristic section. So this provides improvements or changes from previous versions. So in this case, from the recently released or the previous version, which was 1.5. We also have product maturity. Uh, so this is showing us uh, stage validation for the data set. And then we have collections and granules. So here this provides kind of the nitty gritty details about the data. So in this case, the DOI for the data, the file size, 
spatial extent, temporal extent, the coordinate system, kind of those basic things you might want to know about the data set, including how many science data layers there are, as well as pixel size. And speaking of layers, our next section covers the different types of layers within the data product, which Brian spelled out nicely earlier. Um, but in case you need a reference to look at this again, you can go to the DOI landing page and go to the layer section. So here we have the science data set layer name, the description of the layer, the units, the data type, and then if there's any fill values, no data values, valid ranges, or if you need to apply a scale factor. All right, we also have information on product quality, if there's any product quality that you need to know about, as well as if there's any known issues you need to know about within the data set. So like I mentioned, the DOI landing page is very helpful. It provides a lot of key information about the data, and we do offer this feature for every single data product that the LPDAP distributes. So looking at tools, I did mention that there are some data prep scripts you can use to work with HLS data. Uh, we like to say that our tutorials teach you how to fish. Our data prep scripts really do that fishing for you. So here we have a subsetting, processing, and exporting reformatted or HLS superscript, as well as a bulk download script to work with HLS data. Under tools, we also have NASA's Earth Data Search. Uh, that's one of the tools that I'll be demonstrating later. But here you can find out information on documentation on the tool, resources and tutorials for using that tool, as well as a way to cite the tool. So under our resources section, we have quite a bit of resources that I mentioned earlier during my presentation. So under our e-learning section, we have presentations, tutorials, video tips, and previously recorded webinars. Uh, it is filterable by clicking on these buttons here. So let's say we wanted HLS related tutorials. I could just click on tutorials, type in HLS, and then the table filters down to just tutorials that relate to HLS data. And clicking on one of these tutorials, that'll provide some information as well as links to the tutorial in the GitHub and the R markdown. Under resources, we also have an outreach material section for any teachers in the room or anyone who has a blog or anything where you're interested in sharing kind of data examples or just kind of cool pictures of remote sensing imagery. Uh, we have videos, imagery, and fact sheets. Again, this is also filterable. And you can type in HLS and then I'll pull you, show you the resources that we have for HLS data. So we have quite a few videos that we released last year with the announcement of HLS data. Under resources, we also have our FAQs, so frequently asked questions. We have that data in action series that I mentioned. We also have an LPDAC dictionary, so that provides common key terms. And we have this publications table I mentioned earlier. So these are recently published science articles that mention data distributed by the LPDAC. Uh, so in the case of, let's say, HLS S30, I can just type in HLS S30 or if I was on that HLS S30 DOI landing page and I went to that resource section that mentioned the publications table, that would just take me straight to this publications table already filled out to look at just data products that mentioned HLS S30. So it's a great way to be able to learn how other scientists are using these products in their research. We also have a new section called podcast. We have teamed up with the USGS Eros Eyes on Earth podcast to create several different episodes about data distributed by the LPDAC. We actually have an episode featuring Brian. Uh, he gave a great talk with the PI of the data set, Jeff Masek, about um, just kind of general information on HLS data. And all of these podcast episodes range from 12 to 20 minutes. So they're pretty small bite-sized chunks of information, but they're really done in a nice way where you can kind of learn more about these different data sets. And the podcast is available on Apple and Google Podcasts if you're interested, but you can find those links to the episodes on the podcast section of the website. And then finally, we do have the general site search. So if I type in, let's say HLS and hit enter, this will pull up all the different types of content on our website that relate to HLS data. 
So that concludes the website demonstration portion of the webinar. And now I will move over to EOSTIS Worldview. As I mentioned earlier, NASA's EOSTIS Worldview is a great imagery mapping and visualization application. It provides the capability to interactively browse with over 1,000 global res full resolution satellite imagery layers and then download the underlying data. Now, many of the image layers are updated daily and are available within about three hours of observation, essentially showing the, what the entire Earth looks like right now. Worldview uses the Global Imagery Browse Services, or GIBS, to rapidly retrieve the imagery for an interactive browsing experience. And Worldview is an open source code app. Users interested in the code can visit the NASA GIBS Worldview GitHub to learn more. So for today, we're going to look at Worldview and we're going to observe cropland changes near Garden City, Kansas, an area currently experiencing drought using HLS data. Now, if you want a little cheat sheet, quick guide to access HLS data, you could click on this button in the center and that'll provide you a 16 step walkthrough on working with HLS data. But since I'm here with you today, I will guide you through Worldview. So we'll go ahead and close out of this box and now here we have Worldview. I'm going to go ahead and turn on my place layers, place labels and coastlines and borders just by clicking on the eyeball. And then I can see that I do have a corrected reflectance Terramotus product showing on the screen right now. And we can see that it's uploading in real time as they get the data uh, within a couple of hours. Now I'm going to go ahead and add a layer. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this orange button that says add layers. And here I can either look at hazard and disaster layers. Uh, I can search by science disciplines, featured data, or recent data that I've been working with in Worldview. I mentioned we were going to be studying drought, so let's go ahead and click on drought. And then I'm going to click on this land surface reflectance option and select HLS Landsat 8. Now here I have some more information about HLS as well as the layer that I'm going to be looking at in Worldview and also that grid system that I mentioned earlier. And it also has a nice orbit track and time for Landsat 8. So this looks like the data set that I'm interested in. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that layer on. Now let's say maybe you wanted to hop into Worldview and you know exactly what data layer you want or what sensor you're looking for. You can just start typing in that data layer. So I'll type in HLS and then I can turn on the S30 product as well. And now I'm going to click to close this box and I can see that my layers have been added here. So now, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking for cropland in Garden City, Kansas. Uh, I actually happen to be from Kansas, but I'm guessing most people on the call are not. Um, I'm going to start zooming a little bit into Kansas, but let's say maybe you don't have the location of Garden City, Kansas memorized. You can always search for places using the search bar above. So I'm going to type in Garden City, Kansas. And I'm going to hit enter and it's going to zoom me right into Garden City, Kansas. And we can see what the MODIS data looked like the day before. Um, so I can definitely see a little bit of data. This is a 250 meter resolution product. Uh, so let me look and see what that HLS data actually looks like. So here I'm going to go ahead and select. Um, I looked earlier and I was looking at some research from the USDA that mentioned that Garden City, Kansas is experiencing a drought during the week of April 27th of 2022, but this area was not experiencing a drought during the same time period in 2021. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and find data during that week. So I'm going to look at April, I believe it was April 23rd. So I can click and interact with this timeline to find my data. So I can either click on the areas, arrows, or I can type in 23rd. And here I can now see that the HLS layer is starting to load. I can zoom in a little bit more and so I can start to really see details of that cropland data. And if I turn off this layer, I can compare it against that MODIS data. So we're definitely seeing with that finer resolution, um, a lot more detail in that smaller amount of area. Now, as I mentioned, this area is experiencing a drought right now. At the same time last year, it was not. Uh, in Worldview, we can start a comparison mode where we can compare different times over the same area. So I'm gonna pick for my drought year, I'm gonna go ahead and add that 20, April 23rd scene from this year. And then for my A 
I'm going to call this my year four, but this will also be my year that the area was not in drought. Uh, it looked like that was from April 25th of 2021. So I'm going to go ahead and select that data set. Right. And then as I'm moving, I can start to kind of see. Oh, I need to turn my layer on. Sorry about that. There we go. There we go. All right, so I can start to see my data layers as it's loading, and I do have a preloaded one in case it takes a while. All right, so here we can start to make some comparisons on this crop land. So this is showing you what the land looked like during a non-drought year, and then what the land looks like during a drought year. So I can definitely start to make some visualizations using worldview um, by sliding back and forth. So again, this is a non-drought year, this is a drought year. And you can also have several different comparison modes. So I can look at this data and I can compare and kind of blend the two together to see the difference. Or I can even use the spy mode um, and that will show me inside my circle. It'll show me the drought year and then outside the circle is the non-drought year. Um, so we would obviously definitely need to be doing a little more outside research to confirm um, what we're seeing but it is a nice way to be able to see that data and make some initial visual, visualization observations. Now, a lot of us are working from home or working from different offices. So Worldview does offer a really nice option to share this map. So if you wanted to share this map with your colleague, you can click on share this map in the top right, and you can even shorten the link, and then you can copy and paste this and send it straight to your colleague. They can open up Worldview and see exactly what you're seeing. And if you want, I'm going to exit comparison mode. You can take a snapshot of the data. So I'm going to go ahead and click on take a snapshot. And then I can choose my area so I can make it larger, smaller, focus on a certain specific part of the imagery. But I can take a snapshot and then I can add this to my blog. I can add it to my classroom materials. I can add it to my research. Um, it provides just kind of a nice imagery um, from this data set. All right, if I decide that this is data I'm interested in exploring, I can go ahead and click on data. And then I can select one of my data sets. And now I see I have an option to download via Earth Data Search. I'm going to go ahead and set my area of interest. And this is going to filter me down to just the granules that are within my area of interest. So it looks like we have four. I'm going to go ahead and click on download via Earth Data Search. This is warning me I'm about to leave Worldview and go to Earth Data Search. So I'll click on continue. And here I can see Earth Data Search pre-filled out to show me that HLS data over my study area. But I am about to show a demonstration of Earth Data Search, so let's hop back into Worldview real quick to finish out exploring Worldview. Now there is one other really cool feature about Worldview I wanted to show. It doesn't necessarily relate directly to HLS data, but it can if HLS data is available during a specific event. Uh, if you are a teacher in a classroom, um, or if you're just really interested in different kinds of events going on around the planet, uh, Worldview offers a really cool option to make observations and see how the land is interacting. So, for example, we can look at volcanic eruptions. We can look at different types of fire. We can look at iceberg movement. Uh, we can also look at tropical cyclones. Um, so, again, this is not going to show HLS data unless HLS data was available during the time. Um, but this is a really nice way to be able to kind of just observe what's going on around the world. So this shows a tropical cyclone um, making landfall off the southern coast of Madagascar. So it's definitely kind of just a really interesting um, feature in Worldview that I kind of wanted to highlight real quick. But with that, that concludes my demonstration of Worldview. There are several other interesting features and a ton of data to explore in Worldview. So I definitely recommend taking some time to explore it on your own. But for now, we're going to resume our data discovery in Earth Data Search. All right, so here's Earth Data Search. Now, you could go to the LPDAC website, go back under that tool section and find Earth Data Search, and that'll direct you to Earth Data Search. Or you can simply type in search.earthdata.nasa.gov.
As I mentioned, NASA's Earth Data Search is a great tool to use when you want to make sure data is within your study area. Maybe you want to have a preview of your scene if that's available, or maybe you just want to see what other types of data are available in your study area during your study period. So for today, we're going to take a look at HLS data again over Garden City, Kansas for the past year. Now, obviously, I could just have that option of worldview handing me off to Earth Data Search with all of my parameters already filled in. Uh, but since this is a demonstration of how to use Earth Data Search, we'll just start from the very beginning. Now, the first thing to know is you have to log in with your Earth Data Login account. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Earth Data Login at the top right. Now, if you don't have an account, don't worry, they are free to create. And when you click on that button, it'll either sign you into your account or it'll have a prompt to create a new account. So now I can see that I'm signed in. If this is your very first time using Earth Data Search, I do recommend checking out the filter collections. You can filter down to things like only data available from the AWS cloud. Uh, maybe you're specifically interested in data from the LPDAC. You can find the LPDAC under organizations. You can also filter by keywords, platforms, instruments. There's a lot of different options. Uh, but since I'm here to kind of guide you through Earth Data Search, we'll just kind of dive in to start looking for that HLS data. Now, let's say maybe we don't know exactly that we want HLS data, but we know we want surface reflectance data. I'll go ahead and type in surface reflectance. And hit enter. And this is going to bring up all of the surface reflectance data products that are available in NASA's Earth Data Search. So there's 1,006 matching collections. Now I'm gonna go move to my study area. So I'll find Kansas again. We'll zoom on in to Garden City. So we found Garden City. And here I can interact uh, and update my parameters so I can enter in my temporal information. So I mentioned we were gonna look for the past year. I'll just go ahead and say maybe January 1st, 2021 to today, just to make it a little easier for demonstration purposes. Uh, but if you are working with a specific season, uh, or maybe you're only interested in a specific month, you can click on reoccurring and select the months, days, and years that you're interested in, and then I'll filter down to just show data within that time frame. I'm gonna go ahead and click on apply. And then that's going to show me the data products that are within that temporal resolution. So we filter down now to 566. And now I'm going to filter down to my study area. So I'm going to click on this crop icon on the left. And I can either draw a polygon or a rectangle or a circle. I can enter in a point or a coordinate. Or I can upload a shape file that will filter down to my study area. For today, I'm just going to draw a quick polygon. So I'll click and start adding points around Garden City. And then I can click on my first point to close my polygon. And this is now going to filter down the data. Now on the right hand side, you can see these white buttons. These do the same feature and functionality that I just showed you. So polygon, rectangle, circle, or a point. Uh, and you can also look at different views of the globe. So if you're interested maybe in the Arctic or the Antarctic region, and you can use it to zoom in and zoom out and turn on different layers. So now I see that I've moved my down to 539 matching collections. And right now this is sorted by data usage. I'm gonna go ahead and select relevance. And this will bring up the data product. So I'm starting to see my HLS data set. And there are these little badges here. So this orange one tells me that we'll be able to support advanced mapping visualizations using that Gibbs tile service I mentioned earlier. And this gray one tells me that this is the HLS L30 version 2 from the LP DAC. It also has a description of the data sets, how many granules there are, when this data set began, or the earliest date that I can get the data, as well as that long name I mentioned earlier. This looks like the data set I want, so I'm going to go ahead and click on it. And then I'll load my data. So now if you've never worked with HLS data before, maybe you just want to sample a couple of scenes. As I can see on my screen, I'm starting to see that browse preview that Brian was referencing earlier. I can also click on one of these scenes to pull up the preview in a full screen. And I can also see a browse preview to the right. Uh, so since maybe you haven't worked with HLS data before, H Earth Data Search does provide an option to either download all this data right at once, ready to go, 
or you can select specific granules that you might be interested in first, and then maybe you can download the rest of the data layer. So I'm gonna click on these green plus signs and add a couple of layers to my project. Now, speaking of my project, let's say that maybe you're in your data search, you're kind of doing your little data dive, you're learning more about what you wanna use, you're picking out your granules, and then you have to go to lunch, or maybe a colleague stops by and has a question you can always save your project and resume later. So in the top right, we have the save file icon. If I click on that and then just type in, let's say HLS Kansas and hit save, that's now going to save my project. It's gonna save all of my parameters that I've selected. It's even gonna save the data that I've selected. I can go to lunch, I can talk to my colleague, I can go walk my dog, I can come back to Earth Data Search, even on a different monitor. I just have to log in I can click on my name, click on my save projects, and then go right back to where I left off. So it's definitely a nice feature from Earth Data Search. And they also have another nice feature I wanted to highlight called subscriptions. Uh, here you can create a new subscription. So once I click on this button, Earth Data Search is now going to email me when there's HLS data in my study area, there's a new HLS L30 granule. Um, so I'll get an email alert and then I'll know to go to Earth Data Search and I'll be able to see what that new data is. Um, so that's definitely a really handy feature in Earth Data Search. Now let's say you do know the data product you want. In fact, you know the exact short name of the data product you want. You can also search by that short name. So I'll type in HLS S30 and hit enter. And now I can see my matching collections. So here I have the HLS S30 product. I know that's the one I want, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on it. And one thing I did not mention for the L30, but it exists for all of the products in our data search, they do have a way to filter by granules. And these will be based on information that's available with, from that data set. Um, so this can be things like filtering down between day and night, cloud coverage, if that's available, um, the grid coordinates. Um, so it's a nice way if you're looking for specific granules or you just wanna kind of filter down to a subset of granules. But here, let me go ahead and click on these arrows for the plus sign and add a couple more granules to my order. Now I'm gonna go ahead and click on download. And this is going to pull up that HLS Kansas project I saved earlier. I can see that I have eight granules from two collections and I can see what my file size of my order is gonna be. Now this is cloud data, so that's why we're seeing 0.0. .0. And I have my, uh, I can click on the long names to see the granules that I've selected. I have edit options, so that's just showing that I can direct download this data. Um, some data in Earth Data Search is customizable, so you can select specific bands. Um, so that might be a feature that's available, but for this one, for HLS, we'll have direct download. So I'll go ahead and click on download the data, this green button to the left, and this is going to be downloading my data. Now we can see it's already complete, 100% done. That's fantastic. Under that, we have additional resources, so links back to that DOI landing page I showed you before. I'm gonna click on this drop down arrow, and this is going to show me the bands and layers that I can download. So I can click on these links and I can download these files manually using HTTPS URLs, or since this is cloud data, you can also access these data assets while working in the cloud using S3 URLs. So here I have my S3 URLs. So that concludes my demonstration of Earth Data Search. And now we're going to hop back into our presentation so Brian can talk more about the application side of the data. Great, thanks, Daniel. I think now we're ready to do a transition for uh, screen ownership. So if we can go ahead and let me share my screen, that would be great. And then let's see if this works. So, Hopefully you're able to see my screen and if I put that into your presentation mode. Does that look as expected? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So Danielle gave a really nice overview kind of, of how to access the data, uh, the HLS data, how to visualize the data. Um, a lot of the imagery, or at least all of the imagery that she showed in terms of the browse images and the imagery in worldview. Um, was using true color composite. So if you go back to the band information that we were talking about before, that's bands four, three, and two, mosaic to be in the red, green, and blue channels. 
for both HLSL30 and HLSS30. Um, a lot of the imagery that I'm showing here is actually false color composite imagery, uh, and it's largely going to be um, the SWEAR false color composites that we'll show in demo a little bit later. Uh, the urban monitoring one down here on the right hand side is a color infrared uh, false color composite. And you can search those uh, uh, false color composite layers or band combinations for both Landsat and Sentinel to kind of get the combinations uh, for uh, some of these different applications. But some of the applications that you can use HLS data for, uh, Active Fires is one, and we'll show a really nice example of, of that coming up. Um, you can also look at uh, snow extent. So here, this is using, again, that SWEAR false color composite layer. Um, and the snow is showing up really nicely in blue. This is the Himalayas. So let's say you were looking at the retreat of the glaciers in the Himalayas. Uh, you could use uh, HLS data to, to do that. Uh, agriculture is another really good application. Danielle showed you some agricultural plots in Kansas. We have some agricultural plots here in Egypt uh, that uh, I've shown here with, the, again, that SWEAR false color composite. And then the inland flooding is another example. This is actually brought to us from the U.S. Forest Service, uh, where, again, that sewer false color composite can be used to show water outside of the riverbanks. So essentially, you can see the riverbanks here in blue. And then you can see how the water is kind of expanded beyond that uh, in the center of the image. And then urban monitoring. So here the vegetation is going to be displayed as red uh, pixels. Um, and then the urban scar itself is going to be here in gray. And so you can kind of see how urban expansion may be going on in areas where there's rapid urban growth, uh, such as developing countries, or if there's a you know, specific area that you're interested in, that you can kind of track that as a function of time. So this is a nice application. Uh, this is actually in Glacier Park, or Glacier National Park. Um, and so again, you can kind of look at the time series of uh, the glaciers. So this is uh, going back, I believe, through 2017. And you can see the retreat of the glaciers um, here in the image, so the, the nice blue uh, color here to see where the glaciers are actually located. And then you can see the seasonal snowpack. One of the main things that's of interest out west is water availability in the spring. That comes to you know, wintertime snowpack. You can look at the extent of that snow um, and see uh, how that compares to previous years with HLS. As you know, we've mentioned previously, the data does go back to 2013 uh, for the HLS L30 product, and it will extend back to 2015 for the HLS S30 product. So bringing them together uh, will help to provide a, a denser time series of the land surface. Obviously, cloud cover is a big problem. So in increasing the number of observations or the number of chances that you get to get cloud-free observations over these areas really improves upon our understanding of how the land surface evolves as a function of time. Another really nice application, this is looking at uh, the area of the Dixie Fire. And so you can see this is going to go from 2020 uh, through uh, 2022. And you can see that we have this old existing burn scar here that's showing up in this dark reddish hue at the bottom of the image. You can see the seasonal snowpack on top of that. You can see a couple other land features of interest that I'm not going to go too deeply into. But then as we get toward the fire season, you're going to see this fire advance from the south of the image to the north of the image. And you can see the impact that that has on the land surface. The other thing that you can do with uh, the SWEAR false color composite is you can actually map the fire front. I'll show you a nice example of that here coming up. Um, and then you can also see uh, the recovery of the burn scar. So you see that initially it was this nice bright reddish hue. As you start to get vegetation recovery, that's going to start to kind of switch back over to being uh, a more green uh, land surface as you would expect for healthy vegetation. You can also look at the uh, height of the water here. So you can look at the water extent. Um, you can see a little bit of sea ice here on this little lake right here, but you, know, you can watch the water uh, expand and contract uh, with the season to get at water availability. Uh, we talked about water availability out west being a big issue. Uh, you can look at the retreat of, of um, uh, inland water bodies and also ephemeral water bodies uh, in, in Africa is another big one uh, where you can look at uh, land surface water. But I think one of the things that I really wanted to show is the power of the cloud optimized geotiffs. So we talked a little bit about uh, the conversion. So if you've used the, the version 1.4 products, uh, that data was all distributed as uh, HDF files, hierarchical data format. We've converted that now to be cloud optimized geotiffs. And the reason that we did that was because one, NASA is moving a lot of its uh, processing and, and data to the cloud. And two, we're trying to be a bit more forward thinking about 
the analysis and the visualization and the access of this data um, that we're providing. So we talked about the fact that we're generating something on the order of you know, two to four terabytes of data per day. Uh, the entire archive was expected to be somewhere on the order of about three to four petabytes. And obviously that's gonna continue to grow. For a user to access a lot of data at scale, that requires you to have a fairly substantial sized um, hard drive on your computer. And we want to try to shift that uh, analysis and that data access to more of a cloud-based data access uh, format. And we've done that really nicely here with uh, the FIRMS data layer. So if you're not familiar with FIRMS, uh, it's the Fire Information Resource Management site uh, that NASA maintains as part of um, NASA Lance, and it's a collaborative effort with USGS and US Forest Service as well. Let me go ahead and click on this link, and we'll go through this uh, example. So this, uh, the firm's page here, this is what, what you'll see when you click on that link. Uh, if you go and you click on this fire map, uh, you have two options to pick from. You have the firm's global, and then you have the USA and Canada map. There are a few more features that are available uh, within the USA and Canada map than there are with the global map, but you will be able to access the HLS false color composite layer in either one. So I'll go ahead and click on the firm's layer. Um, this is essentially what you'll get when you first click on that. You'll see the active hotspots. So essentially this looks for anomalously hot pixels uh, and the near infrared from Veers and MODIS. Uh, that's all that's really showing you there. Um, but if you want to actually look at the HLS data in firms, you would have to go back and click to the historical uh, tab here at the top right. You would click on this advanced mode. And then you see that there's this tab here titled Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 Imagery. If you expand that, you'll see that we have four different layers here. It gives you the date with which those layers are available. I'm gonna go back to that date so that you can at least see what that looks like. So what you see is that these layers here, they're spotty because they're still being populated, but these are the uh, layers that Danielle was showing in NASA Worldview. So these are directly uh, they should be the exact same layers uh, that you see in NASA Worldview. You can use this to get a general idea of where data is available. Uh, right now, like I mentioned, that data is still populating, uh, so that's why it looks a little bit patchy, but that should fill in here shortly. But the reality of it that I really want to show is uh, the dynamic tiling service that we put on top of the data. So the data, as Danielle mentioned, is all stored um, on the LP cloud or LPDAT cloud. And what we've done is we've essentially taken, um, we've developed a, a tiler, and this has been work done by Sean Harkins at Development Seed and Atmar Alsina, uh, who's uh, a firm's developer, to essentially allow for us to dynamically access those files on demand and then generate this false color composite imagery. And we're using this as a pilot for the future of NASA's visualization. So like I mentioned, we're trying to get a lot of the data uh, migrated over to the cloud. And so what we're trying to do is dynamically allow users to take these bands as they are in individual band files and then do their own band combinations to visualize this data. Right now we're fixing this to be the Sphere false color composite just so that we can kind of start to get something out and learn a little bit more about how we can make that more interactive. Uh, but this is essentially pulling directly on the, the data that's hosted on the LP cloud. So we're not actually downloading any data or anything. This is just visualizing that data directly. So what you're looking at here is this is a fire that's in New Mexico. You can see this uh, nice fire front here is given by the orange shading or the bright orange shading. Uh, you can see again that there's this nice pyrocumulus cloud that's starting to develop at the leading edge of the fire front. You can see where the fire has uh, progressed from. Uh, that's essentially this dark red hue here. That's the burn scar. Uh, that is kind of showing up within the imagery. The healthy vegetation is again shown in the green. Um, and then again, you can see the, the progression of that smoke plume. So if we zoom back out, you'll see that smoke plume kind of advancing from southwest to northeast. So if you're maybe living in some area up here uh, along this river, you know, you can potentially warn people for air quality concerns associated with the wildfire. And so what we wanted to do is essentially provide this as a, a use case for uh, the U.S. Forest Service to be able to actively monitor uh, fires and to then be able to come in and quickly identify burn scars uh, from the imagery. And so the one thing that I'll note is that this is, uh, we only allow the dynamic tiling uh, at certain zoom levels. 
If you zoom further out, it's gonna tell you that it's not supported. And the reason is because for you to tile all the imagery uh, that's in this particular viewer, uh, it would take a significant amount of time uh, for that to happen. It would not be a really good user experience. And so we try to make sure that uh, we're giving you a reasonable uh, amount of time for that dynamic tiling service uh, to get that imagery generated. And as I mentioned, this is something that we're trying to use as kind of a pilot for uh, the future of NASA's visualizations. And so hopefully that's a, a decent overview. I think we've got two links here in the slides, which I believe are gonna be shared later. Uh, this is essentially the firm's landing page that I just walked you through and through an example. This image that I'm showing here is a fire that was in Eastern Mongolia, and you can uh, click on this link here and it'll show you uh, what that looks like. I think one thing that I didn't necessarily mention in the demo that I just showed uh, was that if you look at this seam in the image here, that's essentially the Landsat uh, swath on the left-hand side and the Sentinel swath on the right-hand side. And when we talk about using them interchangeably, what we mean is that the pixels on the right-hand side should look like the pixels on the left-hand side. Um, and so there shouldn't be any kind of observational difference between the Landsat and Sentinel data. And that's what we're trying to achieve here with the harmonization of the two products. Um, and so that's essentially what we're trying to get to with added value. I think there is a question about added value with uh, using the, the harmonized products as opposed to uh, the products independently. I think that that's what we're trying to show is that, you know, we've done an adjustment here to the Sentinel data so that when you compare that with the, the Landsat data, they look identical. Um, and so I think that's the majority of my presentation. I think Danielle has a little bit more information here. Um, so I'm gonna pass it back over to you. Yeah, I was just gonna add real quick. Um, we can leave Brian's slides up, but that brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, if you don't have any questions, I saw there's a lot in chat. So thank you for all of those. We'll be happy to answer them at this point. Uh, and if you do have any questions that you think of later, you can always contact the LPDAX in-house user services team uh, via either the contact information on the screen or the contact us button or contact us section on the LPDAC website. Uh, we also are just LPDAC at USGS.gov. And you can subscribe to our listserv if you wanna be the first to know about any news on HLS data or any new HLS to resources, tutorials, those types of things that we create. Uh, I personally send that message out about once or twice a month. Uh, and it also has new data products and new resources from the LPDAC for all of our data in general. Uh, we do have that Earth Data Forum I mentioned earlier. That's just kind of a place to chat about data with other scientists. And with that, I'll thank you again for listening to us speak and we'll open it up to questions. I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Okay, great. Thank you, Danielle. So I think what we'll do uh, in the spirit of time here, we do have the final optional polls uh, open. I will leave those open for the next 30 minutes or so, but why don't we go ahead and jump directly into the Q&A. And so what I'd like to do first is tackle those questions that have not, not been answered yet within the chat, and then we'll uh, switch gears to the uh, Q&A panel. So the first question here, and I'm just trying to make sure if I didn't miss part of it. Let's see. Brian answered the historical processing question. Okay, so it says, which cloud can we process on the cloud and download the products we produce? And then three, when will HLS? So number one, which, which cloud? Two, can we process in the cloud and download the products we produce? And then finally, when will HLS data become available on uh, GEE? Thank you. Yeah, so I guess I'll go ahead and answer that question first. So right now, all the endpoints that we provide with the HLS data will point to data on the AWS cloud, so Amazon Web Services. Um, that does not necessarily mean that you have to write uh, processing workflows in AWS, uh, but as of now, everything that we do with our processing, with our data uh, distribution, um, that's all going to be with AWS. We are in uh, communication with Google Earth Engine about getting the HLS data products ingested. The one thing that I will request of you is if you are interested in having HLS added to Google Earth Engine, I believe they have a form that you can fill out uh, to request that. Um, I think that they are also looking for, um, they're looking for feedback from users to gauge the interest in, in adding the HLS products to Google Earth Engine. Um, and so I think that the more people that request the HLS products, the more likely that we'll be able to get something done quicker. 
Uh, I do think they were waiting for us to finish the complete archive before they pulled everything over. Uh, so I don't expect that it will be any time within, you know, the 2022 calendar year, but it is something that we are scoping out for the future. Okay, well, thank you very much, Brian. The next question is uh, Landsat 8 to 16 days, Sent Sentinel 10, uh, 5 days. Then how is the time series, how does the time series become 2 to 3 days? Please explain. Yeah, I, I, I saw that question and I started to prep a little bit. And so <laughs> let me show you, can you still see the screen at full? Yes, yes, okay. I definitely can. The NASA Science Visualization Studio has a really nice visualization to kind of show the constellation of Landsat 8, Sentinel 2, and, and sorry, Landsat 8, Landsat 9, Sentinel 2A, and Sentinel 2B. So this is what it looks like with just Landsat 8 kind of circling around. If you add Landsat 9, this is what you see. So they're offset. So you start to get a larger picture, or I guess more complete picture of the globe. You add Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B, those are further offset. So essentially you're sensing data in those data gaps between Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. And so when you use them all in conjunction, you get a more complete picture of the globe. And then as those uh, orbits continue to kind of shift eastward, or sorry, shift westward, it starts to fill in that gap that you have over this particular day, and then fill in um, your revisit period and, and reduce that revisit period for just one single instrument down to two to four days we were talking about before. So hopefully this visualization is helpful. Um, I can push, I'll push this, uh, this link in as well, but that's kind of the way that that happens. I hope, I hope that's a clear answer and I figured visual is better than me talking through it. All right. Well, excellent. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the yep. next question is what is the latency time for new HLS imagery to appear in worldview? Yeah. So the latency time typically is going to be on the order of that two to four day window. There is a little bit more latency for uh, worldview than there is for data being available in um, Earth data search, but it is typically on the order of hours and somewhat negligible. Um, and so you can expect the two to four days that we quote for data being available in Earth data search or at, you know, at LPDAC uh, to, to be the same for uh, NASA, or sorry, for the worldview um, client. Okay, thank you, Brian. The next question is, and then we're going to jump to the Q&A uh, panel. So if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A. Um, I'm preparing to apply Landsat 8 and 9 to monitor lake surface area change for several years, but now I'm thinking to use HLS. The question is, the granules, the gran the granules are mosaic in different dates. Is this acceptable? Let's suppose the same question for Landsat 8, 9, and Sentinel 2. The area of interest with multipath and rows of different days could be collected within closest days of the month or not? Yeah, I think if I understand the question there, I think we're trying to get at kind of like a, maybe like an eight day mosaic or something like that, or, or a, a best image uh, over a certain time range. And yeah, you should be able to mosaic them. That's kind of the idea with the harmonized product is that you should be able to take tiling like we just showed with the dynamic tiler uh, with uh, the sphere false color composite. You should be able to use that same application for uh, using any kind of band combination. So let's say that you're doing like a normalized differential water index. Uh, you should be able to do that same band combination or sorry, that band math uh, for both products and then generate products that can be used interchangeably with Landsat 8 and Landsat 9, and, and the mosaicing uh, should work well between the Landsat 8 sensor, the Landsat 9 sensor, the Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B. All right, great, thank you, Brian. The next question is, can HLS be used for land surface temperature calculations? That's a great question. I saw that one pop up too. I think the answer is no. The temperature that we have is the top of the atmosphere brightness temperature. It's not land surface temperature. Okay, thank you. The next question is, can the data be applied in burn severity mapping using the FMT tool? I am not entirely sure what the FMT tool is, but um, I will have to look at that and get back to you. I'm not sure. Okay, thanks so much. Um, and just for everyone's benefit, I will be sending the Q&A log and the chat log to both of our speakers, so certainly they can, you know, address some of these questions a little bit more in depth if needed offline. The next question is, what type of atmospheric correction is done to the LS LST data, or is it top of atmosphere data? You kind of just answered that, actually. Yeah. 
Yep. All right. Let's see here. Can you say a little bit more about the atmospheric correction process? Will Veer's data be used for this rather than MODIS when the latter is no longer available? That's a great question. Yep. We're actually in the process of, of doing some testing with some of the Veer's data. And I, I, I don't want to take credit for that work. Um, that work is largely being done uh, by the Lancet Science Research and Development Team at USGS. And so I think I saw uh, Callie Jenkerson was on the uh, phone a little bit ago. Uh, we've worked with her and then Gail Schmidt and Chris Crawford and their team at USGS. And they're working really hard to make sure that that, uh, that it's um, Landsat Surface Reflectance Code, the CERC algorithm, is ready to go. And it will largely be interchangeable between the data that was atmospheric, uh, atmospherically corrected using MODIS and the data that's being going to be atmospherically corrected using VIRS. And so that's, that testing is being done by USGS. Um, and we're working in collaboration with them. Uh, on that. Okay, thank you, Brian. The next question is, I started an analysis with the V1.4 data on a large scale. Should we expect enough difference with the V2 data? Ah, excuse me, I just lost my place here. I think if uh, it helps if none of the panelists are looking up the questions while I'm trying to uh, go through these because then I, it, it doesn't, it actually skips around. So, <laughs> And then, I, and then I've lost my place. Okay, so should we expect enough difference with the V2 data that it would be recommended to start over with the newest version? There shouldn't be that significant of a difference. There, there will be a difference between version 1.4 and 2.0. And the reason is because we're using different atmospheric correction models. Um, I think we're also using different F-mask algorithms. We talked about you know, cloud masking and QA. Um, the algorithms have changed between 1.4 and 2.0. And while I don't think that it's going to be a significant difference where it should cause too much of a problem with using them interchangeably, I think that the workflow in accessing the data is going to be significantly different. And so if you're going to try to blend them, uh, that it may make more sense for you to use the, uh, the 2.0 data just to get yourself familiar with the new access mechanisms uh, and then the new data format with, with the Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. The next question is, what is the best or recommended way to access the data? For example, through Stack, API, LPDAC? Danielle, do you want to take that one? Or do you want me to assume? You can if you want. Um, I'll always pick LPDAC. <laughs> but um, yeah. so we have a, several different options, and that really depends on what you're looking for and what you're most comfortable with. Um, I will say data from the LPDAC, since we are the original distributor of the data, it will be always the most recent copy of data. Um, there's other data products in our archive where we've reprocessed just a specific set of months within that data. And sometimes Google Earth Engine won't always pull that data immediately. Um, sometimes they won't pull that data for a couple of years. Um, so if you are wanting the most recent data and the most um, most recent data from the science team, you'll want to get that from the LP deck. I don't know, Brian, if you had any other things that you would like to add. No, I think that's I think that's probably the best that's the best way. Um, you know, the NASA stamped HLS products will always come from LP DAC, whether that be through a direct download or whether that be through the cloud-based uh, S3 endpoints that are also provided. Um, and you can find all of those in the the product metadata that we provide uh, to LP DAC. So if you go back to Earth Data Search and you click on uh, one of those granules, you can expand out, look at the metadata, and you can find um, the data access URLs that will have both the direct download links and then also the S3 endpoints for you to access the data from either mechanism. And Aaron Fries, our science coordination lead, is also on the call. Aaron, did you have anything you wanted to add about Stack API? Since I noticed that was also in the question. He's probably not able to unmute himself, so let me, I guess, let me find him in the list and uh, give him privileges. Um, that might be a little harder than, let's see here. So I think I'll, I'll try to answer that question as best I can for my limited knowledge. And so um, what I'll say is that we are also generating the stack metadata records which also have those S3 endpoints available. Um, and you should be able to use those CMR stack uh, API, or sorry, yeah, the, C CM the stack API um, to access the chunks of data that you need as opposed to accessing the full tile or um, you know, having to do mosaics on your own. 
the CMR Stack API can do that for you. So if you're looking for a Mosaic application, that's probably where you may want to go. Um, and you know the the dynamic tiling service that we just showed for firms is built off of that's that Stack API. Okay. Well, so I. I believe I've unmuted Aaron if he would like to add anything. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So um, different applications uh, require kind of different um, access mechanisms, I guess. guess. Um, Earth Data Search is a fantastic tool for finding and accessing, downloading uh, those data. So if you're, you're wanting kind of a manual way of getting at those data, that's a, a great tool. Um, the CMR API and the CMR stack API both have uh, capabilities to, to search for uh, HLS data assets um, from Python or R or any kind of uh, REST API or REST service. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, tutorials and how-to guides on how to do this from Python um, and from R. Uh, so definitely check out our, the, the uh, resources on the LPDAC for that. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's about it. Okay. Well, thank you, Aaron. I'm going to place you back on mute and we'll continue on with the Q and A. Thank you. Okay, everybody. The next question. Now I am skipping over a couple of questions that I believe have been answered, um, within some of the previous questions. Um, so the next question is, it says that HLS is a daily product. Do you perform any gap filling? We don't. So if you looked at that uh, video that I just showed before with the Landsat and Sentinel Constellation uh, that Science Visualization Studio puts out, um, that's essentially what you can expect our products to look like on the daily scale. We do produce them every day, but there will be gaps that are associated with that. Well, thank you so much, Brian. The next question is, are there any prep scripts available for doing uh, the corrections ourselves? For example, to harmonize Landsat 9 images. Yeah, so what I'll say about the Landsat 9 images is that we are actually, we, we turned on that processing um, Tuesday. We plan to go back and, and generate the HLS L30 data products from Landsat 9 uh, back to January 1 of 2022. Um, so all that data will be available. We do plan to open source the code at some point. I don't think that it's all open source at this point. Um, I will say that it is somewhat computationally expensive to do it yourself, um, but you could do that. Um, and, uh, you know, if there is interest in doing that, we could obviously share out some of that code once it becomes public. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. The next question is, does the HLS L30 product provide both surface reflectance and top of the atmosphere brightness or only surface reflectance? Yes, it is surface reflectance. Uh, this is sorry for the yeah HLS L30 product. It is both surface reflectance and top of atmosphere brightness temperature. So we carry the two thermal bands, but they are resampled to be 30 meters, um, whereas I think natively they're distributed at 100 meter resolution. Okay, great. The next question is: Is there a tool or script to identify how many HLS imagery L30 and S30 are available in a specific year for a given bounding box? Absolutely. So I think one thing that Aaron was mentioning just now was using CMR API to do that. Um, there are some really nice scripts that LPDAC has put out. We also have some that we're planning to share with LPDAC to put onto uh, that resource page for you to be able to do that. But if you're not familiar uh, with the CMR API, uh, they do have a documentation page that can help you get started. And obviously, if you have any issues, you can contact me because we've had to use the CMR API quite a bit. Uh, just to verify that you know everything that we're looking for within uh, the products uh, is there. Um, so we do have a lot of familiarity there and you can also use the API. Okay, thanks so much, Brian. And I think once we are finished with the Q&A in another six minutes or so, what I'll do is I'll place a link to the CMR API um, within the chat. Okay, so the next question is, will HLS data be available through appears? It, that is on our plan in the future. Um, I don't have an exact date or estimate of time, but it will be available in the future. 
Okay, thank you, Danielle. The next question, which I only provided a simple answer to is, can we use HLS data to do land cover and land use research? Yep, that's actually exactly what it's supposed to be used for. <laughs> so my answer so only said, yes, you can. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is the perfect application for it. Okay, awesome. So the next question is, could you, could you pre, wow, excuse me. Could you just briefly summarize why the harmonized data is better than the separate products alone? Yeah, I, I touched on that a little bit in the firm's demo, um, but I think really what the, the benefit comes from there is that we've adjusted the data values for the Sentinel-2 bands, and it's called a band pass adjustment, so that they can match the Landsat 8 uh, counterpart. So if we were to go back, and maybe I can do that quickly, I'm not sure how easily I can do that, but if we go back to these bands, you'll see that they're not quite the same for the different bands between HLS S30 and HLS L30. There's some subtle differences here. And so what we do is we essentially go and uh, apply, it's just a linear function um, to adjust the Sentinel data to match the Landsat data. So that if you're looking at a pixel level, uh, let's say that you're looking at a particular plot or you're looking at a, let's say you're looking at the plot field that's in Kansas, um, you can essentially use HLS L30 data and HLS S30 data, and they should give you comparable surface reflectance values. Uh, that can help you provide a time series in terms of what that surface reflectance looks like. If you were to use those products individually, um, you would not be able to do that pixel level comparison because one, they're on two different grids. Uh, they are at a 10 meter resolution for the Sentinel data and 30 meter for Landsat. Um, and then also uh, we've re-projected everything to be on the same MGRS tile grid so that a pixel in the HLS S30 data matches exactly with a pixel that's in the HLS S30 data. Hopefully Thank that you. was clear. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay, so the next question is, and we're, we've got about four minutes left to the Q&A. <coughs> Excuse me. Are there any plans for a future HLS with a 10 meter resolution? For example, for mineral mapping, it would be very useful. We're talking about ways that we can improve upon HLS. I don't know if the 10 meter product is one that we, that is at the top of the list. I'll at least say that. Um, I do know that the Europeans with the European Space Agency are doing uh, what they call a Sentu like product where they take the Landsat data down to 10 meters and then adjust the Landsat data to match Sentinel. Um, so it's kind of HLS, but based off of, you know, the Sentinel data as the ground truth. Uh, and so, if that project continues on and they've ever become operational, they may be producing a 10 meter product and we are working in collaboration with them uh, to support that. Um, but for now, for HLS specifically, we are not looking at doing a 10 meter product. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you, Brian. The next question is, is it possible to visualize underwater vegetation like seagrasses, for example? I don't think so. Uh, I think that's probably something where starting to get to the, the bounds of the HLS uh, application. We have really fine-tuned the algorithm to perform best over land. Uh, getting, you know, water, uh, like looking at uh, something like a harmful algal bloom may not necessarily be uh, a perfect application because, you know, the atmospheric correction code does not necessarily perform all that well over water. There can be some um, discrepancies. So uh, if you compare two images, they may look different uh, over the same water body when conditions are similar. And so uh, I would think that getting beyond uh, the surface level of the water would cause even further um, problem with using the HLS products. Okay, thank you. The next question is to choose area of interest instead of digitized directly on the website, could we use our own prepared polygon to determine AOI? Yep, and so there is a, a, a an icon in Earth Data Search that you can click and then upload your own uh, polygon. Um, you can also provide a polygon or a bounding box into CMR API and search it uh, programmatically if you didn't want to use the user interface to do it as well. I could be wrong. I think this may have came in during the firm's demo. Oh, during the firm's demo. Um, so then I guess I'm more confused about the application there. I apologize. Can you repeat the question? 
Sure. Let me go back up here. Okay. To choose the area of interest instead of digitized directly on the website, could we use our own prepared polygon to determine AOI? I'm not sure that firms takes in an AOI because typically it's, you know, for my, monitoring fires themselves as opposed to accessing the data um, through a data search. So I'm not sure I have a good answer for that one. So if it's looking at a firm's application, I don't know that that's the intended use for firms there is to provide your own polygon, but I could be wrong. I didn't develop firms, so I could be wrong there, but I think. Um, and we can certainly um, pass yeah, this along to back. Diane Davies, uh, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. And so we probably have time for just this one last question. Is there an anticipated sunset date on the HLS data product? Um, as users, can we expect HLS to be around for another two, five, 10, et cetera years? Uh, I can't tell you much beyond five years, but I know that we are funded for at least the next five years. Uh, and we typically do funding in five year cycles. So I think that we, uh, we do not have a plan to stop HLS production at any point. We're planning for uh, when Sentinel-2C launches, the inclusion of Sentinel-2C, when Sentinel-2D, if it launches, uh, the inclusion of it, and then Landsat next. Um, so we are planning for those uh, future integrations of new instruments, which would prolong, obviously, the life of HLS. So at this point, we do not have a plan to sunset it. Uh, and we, do, we are planning just to continue to uh, produce these products in perpetuity. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. And with that, I would like to uh, thank both of our speakers, Danielle Golan and Brian Freitag, and to thank all of you who are still sticking around um, for participating this afternoon. What I will do is I will leave the virtual meeting space open an additional 10 minutes or so. So I, I know that there are some questions that were posed within the chat kind of later on, and also in the Q&A panel that have not been addressed yet, but rest assured that I will send these along to our speakers and they'll be able to follow up with you um, offline. So with that, we'll log off from the audio component. Um, I don't know if our speakers have any final remarks, and uh, we hope to see you at an upcoming webinar. Yeah, just want to say thank you all for joining us. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, thank you for your uh, interest in using HLS products, and I hope that you find a good use for it. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good morning, afternoon, or evening. All right, goodbye now. Bye.